Welcome back or welcome if you're just joining us. It's the France Vanquette debate. We're looking at what they're calling the Panama Papers, an investigation uh, leaked uh, by a single source from a Panamanian law firm that uh, reveals four decades worth of documents, 11 and a half million of them processed by major media that include Germany's Süddeutsche Zeitung, uh, Britain's The Guardian, France's Le Monde, with us to talk about it from Washington, Will Fitzgibbon of the International Consortium of Investigative Journalists, the ICIJ, uh, who has been poring over those documents for months. Welcome back to the show. Welcome back as well to uh, Craig Capitas, editor-at-large for TRT World, whose book, uh, Metal Men, took him undercover to firms that hide their money offshore. And from uh, London, Kingston University's Steve Keen, the author of Debunking Economics, uh, that uh, we mentioned just before the break, Lionel Messi, and also mentioned uh, Frenchman Michel Platini, two footballing legends, they employed the services of Mossack Fonseca. That's not a complete surprise in view of their existing issues uh, with money. But uh, what's got to sting the most at FIFA headquarters this Monday is the naming of a member of its own ethics committee charged with ruling on cases like that of Platini, Uruguayan attorney and club owner Juan Pedro Damiani. Damiani, who reportedly also managed companies through which FIFA members may have received uh, bribes. Steve Keen, uh, we were talking in part one of our discussion about how there has to be a global approach. Uh, mm. What do you do in this particular case? <laughs> well, I mean, Craig's got a lot of good points he made earlier about uh, this being the sort of thing that uh, capitalism is about secrecy. You know, you, you, you try to socialise your losses, privatise your profits. It's always about disguising. And partly... I really think it's going to be more political fallout than anything else. And the political fallout pushing us further in the direction of saying we've had enough of these Blairite politicians and the Labor Party side of things, or Clinton back in America, uh, that talk about being good managers. And we actually know that this is all going on in the, in the background, in the, in the system that we were told was going to operate more efficiently with a more deregulated system. So I've got a feeling it's going to help part of the pressure to back towards more regulation and more pressure for you know, wage rises for workers, because at least they get to see something in their pockets rather mm. than seeing the money filter through to the, the, the rich in, in the Bahamas. All right. the Bahamas. It's unfair to claim that nothing has been done. Uh, the Panama Papers find that the numbers of newly incorporated offshore companies is, in fact, on the wane after uh, peaking uh, just uh, as the financial crisis uh, hit. So obviously, Craig Capitas, when you look at that graph, yeah. something has been, happened. Yeah, well, things go in ebbs and flows. They will, you know, they will go back up. But what Steve's talking about here is he's actually on a very good point. You know, what's going on here is that good economics is a balancing of Keynesian and Friedman, you know, Chicago school and Keynes. You know, how are you going to do in that? In plain English, between free market between and free market regulation. And full, yeah, full, full tilt boogie uh, uh, socialism, OK? Both full tilt free market uh, markets and full tilt boogie socialism are bad things. But what's what's gone wrong here is 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 that no one's trying to balance it anymore. And it really has tipped uh, you know, in the other direction. Now, these companies are real easy to set up. Ah. How do you explain this, then? The fact that the number of offshore companies incorporated has gone down since the financial crisis. Well, <coughs> offshore companies were principally created for trading deals, commodities, oil, natural gas. As we've seen those prices go down, not that many deals going down. This is likely, in my estimation, why this is happening. Now, back in the day, yeah. look at those years. And When I was doing this, go back to, to 1980, 85, you know, from 77 up, where, where there was this growth rate. You could walk into the Panamanian embassy or consulate in London, give them $1,500, and you had, a, you had a Panamanian company. This was done on a daily basis. And I think it's important that listeners understand why. If you happen to be a trading company located in the city of London and you're doing a deal which is moving material from, say, Shanghai to Canberra, Australia, you set up a company that's in charge of that deal because that product, none of it, ever is in England. And the logic is, why should it be taxed in England? And that's legal. Uh, Will Fitzgibbon, your reaction to what Craig Capitas just said, the number of those offshore companies being incorporated down not because of 
uh, good government regulation since the financial crisis, but simply because of slumping commodity prices? Hmm. Well, I'm, I'm going to defer to some expertise there. Um, I mean, that seems right to us. And also, I think there is a role that regulation has played. You know, we've seen in a few emails from the files that over recent years there was cre increasing uh, awareness or even fear among certain customers who wanted to end the companies that they had incorporated. I mean, the way it's been described to me in the past, this offshore industry is, however, that it's a bit like whack-a-mole. Regulators <laughs> will hit one jurisdiction on the head and it'll go back down, but then you'll soon have one that pops up again and starts seducing and advertising customers who want its services, and they'll kind of grow it from there. All right, how to break this cycle of whack-a-mole. Uh, just mm. before, uh, before the break, uh, Craig Capitas was mentioning how uh, why at the EU level uh, there isn't a common policy. The Commissioner Pierre Moscovici on Breakfast Radio here in France this Monday pointed to a recent OECD tax cooperation agreement to enable automatic country-by-country -country information sharing, saying the EU now needs to follow suit. We must be able to establish transparency. Transparency, that's the key word. It will happen through an automatic exchange of information, through defining what the European Union calls a tax haven, and through making a list of tax havens, which doesn't exist yet in the Eurozone. That's the EU Commissioner asking for that. Yeah, and my, my response to this, let's put it right on the table. The next time you get an OECD official in here, ask if he pays taxes. OECD salaries are tax-free, and if, if you're in a jurisdiction such as the United States, where you have to pay a tax, they'll go into their own pocket and pay that for you in the OECD. So I don't want to hear about the OECD. They're just as culpable here as everyone else. And as far as this, but they have brokered this 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 um, agreement to trade uh, information between well, countries. Yeah, the information is not traded, Francois, unless someone gets a major leak, and the cost of the uh, enforcement and prosecution investigation is very high. This is all very nice coming out of the OECD and the 16th arrondissement, and they've been preaching this tune for years. No, but in this case, it's the EU Commissioner saying that the EU now has to have common rules on this. Well, the EU has to have common rules. They can't even even uh, 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 agree on a bailout for Greece. The EU is a hollow shell. These deals, the, the tax structures are made by sovereign nations, not by a phony United States of Europe. The tax structures, these types of laws are sovereign. They're created by the UK, Ireland, France, Something that is completely legal in France might not be legal in Romania. And unless the EU decides that they're going to get rid of national sovereignty among all the members and create a United States of Europe, this is going to continue. This kind of talk is that shadow dance that Steve was talking about earlier on. I call it a kabuki dance. All right, so Steve, if the EU will never agree to common rules uh, to crack down on tax avoidance, what do you do? Well, I think that back to Craig's point, you've got to do it at the national level, and the EU has become a total farce. I mean, let's let's be frank about this right now. It can't manage its own economy. It's caused depressions in Spain and Greece. Uh, its policies are totally bankrupt, and this is yet another sign of it. So I think uh, the whole idea that supranational bodies like that can actually do something sensible, it's a charade, and we're seeing it exposed now. Seeing it exposed, uh, nonetheless, uh, the idea of common rules... Uh, throughout the 28. Uh, do you subscribe to that? <sighs> Not if Brussels is running it because it's an undemocratic centre. I, 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 I'm no great fan of democracy, but I'm more of a fan of that than having a bunch of authoritarian neoclassical economists running the world. <laughs> and that's what Brussels has turned into. Not Keynesian, by the way, Craig. It's the neoclassicals are a real problem. <laughs> OK, I'll, I'll, I'll give you that, Steve. <laughs> All right. Uh, uh, little little support for, for a pan-European solution uh, among our panelists. Uh, the uh, French president himself, who uh, early in his mandate saw his crusading budget minister done in by a tax evasion scandal. He had accounts in Switzerland and Singapore. Well, François Hollande welcoming the Panama Papers findings. It's a good news that we have knowledge 
It's good news that these revelations have come to light because this will bolster our country's tax revenue even further and the money will come from those who defrauded us. So thank you to whoever raised the alarm, the media outlets that took action, and I'm sure that our investigators are more than ready to examine this case for the good of what one would like to think, morality, and for the good of our public finances. Will Fitzgibbon, uh, the French finance minister, recently said that there was an extra 3 billion euros uh, worth of uh, tax revenue uh, come in for fiscal uh, 2015. And uh, he points to the fact that uh, whistleblowing has indeed helped. Uh, you heard that thank you from the French president. Can you tell us a little bit more? It was, what, a single source that uh, gave you all those documents? Uh, to be completely honest, uh, and you'll believe me or not, I actually have no idea. What ICIJ knows and what our partners know is that a source approached journalists at Süddeutsche Zeitung in Germany. They then made the decision, uh, very, a very big decision on their part, to say this is so much information, it concerns so many countries in the world and there's so much public interest here that we can't possibly keep it just for ourselves. Let's share it with a consortium of international journalists who can work out mm. and spend months, even a year, finding out national angles of interest. But what do you deduce from uh, the documents you've seen as to who leaked them and why? Um, I, I don't know. I mean, the source will have his or her own mo motivations. Um, I mean, I think that certainly from what we've seen within the documents, all the journalists who worked on it, and these are 400 journalists who don't always agree on everything and in many cases have been bitter rivals in terms of breaking news for many years, and yet it was pretty clear to all of us almost immediately that there was information and revelations in these files that had significant public interest that could potentially lead to <coughs> action uh, on a national or international scale. You think the EU is going to have that kind of cooperation? You know, you can't get three journalists in a room without four arguments breaking out to get that many together to do this kind of yeoman work. Do you, uh, do you see the EU? Or the OECD getting people together to do what's necessary next? I don't think so. Uh, on that point, and let's also look at who look look at where this came from. This, uh, by, by the looks of it, this is another very morally motivated individual, just like Edward Snowden was, and uh, and Chelsea Manning as well, for that matter. It isn't the organisations at the top level that are exposing this corruption. It's individuals who see the stench close up and can't stand it and then bring it to public attention. And that tells us something about the very inverted moral pyramid we live in these days, where the people at the bottom of the pyramid who are getting no returns out of it have got far more moral sense than the ones at the top. Uh, on that point, uh, Will Fitzgibbon, uh, the, uh, when you look at all the documents uh, that, that you've uh, pieced together, and you see the way you've just been describing to us that you go through it methodically. Uh, we now have precedence, what with uh, uh, the LuxLeaks uh, scandal of last year, for instance. It's sort of become the drill. You heard there Steve Keen talking about Edward Snowden. Uh, are we into a new era of transparency? Or again, is this just something that's going to blow over? Uh uh, well, I guess we'll see tomorrow if we get any new USB keys in our post office box. Um, I mean, certainly ICIJ has now worked on a number of leak projects which, which have come from different sources. And as a journalist, there's been a real growth and boon in technologies that will enable, enable us to work on enormous projects, um, not only to analyse and manage the kinds of data that we receive, but to share that in a secure and professional mm. way with hundreds of other colleagues across the world. So you're suggesting that uh, there uh, will be tighter curbs in the future? Tighter curbs on transparency? Yeah. Well, I mean, we, we would hope so. People are certainly making those, making those sounds now, and it's only been 24 hours after the launch. The, uh, the issue going forward, Francois, is the cost of investigation and potential prosecution of, of any malfeasance that arises from these leaks. It is going to take a lot of time and a lot of effort and coordination to do it. And tax authorities around the world, the ex people who are expert in this, they're losing workers. The IRS in the States right now is very undermanned. It's the same in most major countries. Proving this stuff legally in a court of law 
yeah. is exceptionally difficult. I lived through this with the Mark Rich case, which took years. And uh, you're going to have discovery going on if this happens in, in the United States or in some European countries. Explain venues. what discovery is. Well, discovery is, is that, uh, is that uh, uh, the defendant has the right to go to the prosecution and get all the evidence that they have accumulated and to question it in court. That's what discovery is. There's some, in, the, in France, there is no discovery process, for instance. And then the other question is, in which jurisdiction would you prosecute this? What wow. if you are... There you bring up an important yeah. point. Earlier, you reigned on the EU in a, in, yeah. a quite, in a quite definitive manner. But we've seen over the past couple of years that the U.S. prosecutors have gone after banks. Ah, wow. Saying, you do business on our... On our, on our territory, we have the right to prosecute you for money laundering for the Janjaweed militias in Sudan, breaking the embargo Indeed. on Iran, Mexican drug dealers uh, doing business with them. What if the Eurozone does the same thing? I can't see the Euro. The Eurozone has a hard time getting up in the morning. They had their airport <laughs> closed in Brussels for, what, 12 days? So that they can't even get their airport back online, then I don't see any. Eurozone based in Frankfurt, though. Oh. This is going to come out of Brussels. It's not going to come out of Frankfurt. This has got to come out of Brussels, and they can't coordinate. The U.S. will take the lead on this because, as you correctly say, if anything's going through a U.S. bank, or even if it involves U.S. dollars, the U.S. Justice Department will get involved. And, Francois, this opens another huge can of worms here, which is the concept of U.S. enforcing its laws extraterritorially. A lot of people don't like that including the French government, the British government, the Irish government. It's another can of worms here. But these banks, this is where they're going to probably go after them, Francois, through the banks, because the United States Justice Department will say, you don't give us all this information, you know what we're going to do? We're going to pull your banking license in the United States and you're going to lose all that business. That's why Credit Suisse and UBS paid fines and gave up people because they wanted to keep it going. But you know what's happened now since that over the past two years is you have a number of banks that aren't doing business in the United States anymore so that they're not caught up in this extraterritorial web. Steve Keen, uh, in that regards, uh, do you look in, in view of the Panama Papers at uh, those U.S. prosecutions of big banks under a different light? Oh, the U.S. banks, uh, and even though I think they've been total wimps compared to how they were when Bill Black read the, uh, led, led the very effective prosecution of savings and loans, the American uh, enforcement agencies tend to have much more teeth and are much more willing to bite than the European counterparts. So, yes, that's where people would be afraid of America actually having an impact upon their business. But I think this comes back again to the power of the banks and the, the role they've got in modern society. And... Clearly, it's a role which corrupts modern society. It doesn't benefit it. We need to have much smaller banks, a much smaller banking sector, and much smaller private debt, which is what gives them their power, than we've got at the moment. And I think it's just another sign of just how bad it is when you let the banking sector dominate the, the, the physical capitalist world. Uh, let the dominate. But in the case now of, of what's going to happen uh, going forward, Steve Keen, uh, is it really just up to the Americans to do the prosecuting? No, it's not. I mean, the English are another group who could do something about it, but having had personal experience of how bungling the tax officials are here and even trivial details about who I'm employed by, for my taxes, I don't hold that much hope here. I think, again, the Americans are better resourced and, and more likely to put in practice the, their laws than the English are. But some jurisdictions have to take a bite, and obviously the American is the biggest one on the planet, the one that would most worry most of these people who are trying to slip underneath national barriers. Will Fitzgibbon, it's, it's a funny thing, isn't it? Because the U.S. is the one where the regulators are uh, doing the most. And yet uh, the U.S., as Craig Capitas was pointing out earlier, has its own tax havens, you might say, in places like Delaware yeah. and Nevada. Yes, absolutely. It is somewhat of a contradiction. Uh, and we know from the files that Mossack Fonseca had a presence in Nevada, for example. So America is very much involved as a country in the documents, the 11.5 million documents. Um, at the same time, you know, certainly ICRJ and other reporting partners have engaged a lot in stories that have been published and that are soon to come out with American authorities. And I guess we'll see how the cookie crumbles when it comes to any kinds of investigative or enforcement actions.
Uh, by the way, Will, I don't know if you know, but uh, I included in, in, in the reports that you've published is that there's an unnamed French political party, and everybody here is dying to know what that party might be that is uh, named in the Panama Papers. Uh, you don't ha have anything on that, do you? No, nope, it's the first I've heard about it. We encourage collaboration, but as you can imagine, journalists don't share everything always. All right. We'll what about to... the possibility of listing this stuff in the same way WikiLeaks has done, putting these documents online? I think a lot of people would... Uh, would you've done a brilliant job so far, and I totally congratulate the journalists who've done this, but it would be magnificent to finish this by putting all the documents up in a searchable index online, as WikiLeaks has done and Snowden did. That would be very I think interesting. The plan is... Yeah, I think the plan is, as ICIJ announced and other partners announced yesterday, in a few weeks' time, you know, once certain due diligence and fact-checking has been gone through, yeah. there will be a large new database that will allow companies and certain information to be explored. All right, more surprises Good. still to come. Will Fitzgibbon in Washington, I want to thank you. I want to thank Steve Keen in London, Craig Kapitas. Thank you for being with us here in the France 24 debate. Stay with us. Our Media Watch segment is next. And we say hello to uh, James Creedon. Hi, Francois. So, look, uh, trying to sum up the, the buzz online about this story is a futile task because it is impossible to sum it up in three minutes, but I will try. Uh, first of all... Starting with the Ireland angle. The Ireland <laughs> angle? Wh 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 which... I don't know. I'm just kidding. Sorry. <laughs> I haven't even got to look at that yet. There's so many different angles. Uh, first of all... The, I, I don't know if there's an Ireland angle. Oh, there, there might be. There's think, always an Ireland <laughs> angle. I think every country has had some, uh, some person featuring... Uh, on the list. Anyway, the journalism angle first. This is a, another big, uh, I suppose, success story for collaboration across various different media, uh, investigative journalism and all of that. So uh, for accountability, for uh, investigative journalism, two thumbs up, uh, to say uh, the least. Uh, and as uh, this article in theconversation.com says, as Facebook posters like to remind us 1% of the world's population owns half the wealth and they like to hoard it, but maybe things could start to be changing if we have more revelations like this that are holding, uh, well... Yeah, because the issue of income inequality coming up a lot right. during our discussion. Right. And also the issue of, uh, well, there's so many angles, but to, to move forward to another angle, uh, the fact that uh, one thing that, in, that's, that is in common with uh, the uh, wiki, uh, not with the WikiLeaks leaks, but the... Uh, the uh, Edward Snowden leaks is, uh, no, that's not what I'm looking for, is that the real scandal is what is actually legal. It's not that so many people have been engaged in illegal behaviour. It's, well, actually stashing your money uh, uh, in, in these accounts. You know, it's, it's usually possible to do it uh, while respecting the law. Does it mean it's moral? No. Does it mean it's ethical? No. Uh, but, uh, for, ha for example, uh, here, here's the article I was talking about, Glenn Greenwald, unsurprisingly, um, because mm. he was so key to the Snowden uh, NSA leaks, uh, pointing this out. Uh, um, elsewhere in that, in that article, he says, look, if, if you had uh, in, the, in the Cayman Islands or in... Uh, Panama or elsewhere, activities that were affecting negatively, for example, the pharmaceutical industry, you might imagine that the US authorities would crack down on it very quickly. That's just one example he gave. In other words, perhaps a blind eye is being turned to a lot of this uh, in immoral, unethical behaviour, keeping it within the realms of legality because too many influential people mm. are involved in it. They use this. You, governments use these structures for intelligence operations and have for years. That right. is one of the reasons why they right. turn a blind eye to it. Right, right. So that's another angle, I guess, the fact that uh, it's not so the much... Fund that, counterintelligence. That's right, and the fact that it, a lot of this is legal. A quick look at Edward, tw uh, Edward uh, Snowden's Twitter account. It is interesting to look at it today. Uh, he's focusing a lot on Iceland, funnily enough, less so on Russia, because Russia, of course, has given him uh, asylum, essentially. Uh, biggest leak in the history of data journalism just went live, and it's about corruption, and you can see uh, an image there about Iceland. If you look at the comments, some saying, uh, I wonder why you didn't tweet the illustration from Su Deutsche Zeitung uh, focusing on Vladimir Putin. I guess, <laughs> you know, maybe if I was uh, <laughs> seeking asylum in Russia, uh, after a huge leak like that, I mightn't start sharing too much information about Mr. Putin myself. 
Something to think about. Yeah. <laughs> Can we seek asylum in Ireland? Can you organize that for us? May, maybe so. Maybe so. It depends on what illegal activities you've been. <laughs> All right. I want to thank. I want to thank you, James. Or Peden. immoral. <laughs> I want to thank our panel once again. Thank you for being with us here in the France Vanquette debate. Much more to come on this story.